on this 4.8 magnitude earthquake uh, centered in White House Station, New Jersey, felt here in Connecticut. We've been inundated with calls this morning. It's all people are talking about right now. Let's get out to Ari Perez. He's an associate professor of civil engineering at Quinnipiac University. Ari, thanks for your time. Uh, give us a sense of the size and scope of this earthquake. And it, again, it only happened about 40 minutes ago at about 1023. And what you make of what occurred here in the Northeast this morning. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for having me. Well, you know, I think, as you were mentioning, any earthquake in Connecticut is something that is a little bit out of the usual, and so it's normal that folks are a little bit worried. Uh, I, I agree completely with what you said. This is very different than the earthquake in Taiwan. When you think of the ratings on the Richter scale, um, it doesn't go up linearly. It actually goes up exponentially. So a magnitude 6 earthquake is actually 10 times worse than a magnitude 5 which would then make a magnitude seven, a hundred times worse than, than a magnitude five. And so even though a 4.8 is, you know, something that is clearly able to be felt even at a long distance, it is not surprising to me that there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of damage yet, hopefully. Typically, Professor, with a 4.8 magnitude earthquake, what would be the scope of that? Uh, again, it seems to me, from what we're gathering so far, it's going 100 plus miles out from wherever it's centered. Is that typically what we would expect from a 4.8 magnitude earthquake? So it really depends. When you have an earthquake, what happens typically, right, and this is just a very simple explanation, is that you get two plates that are kind of locked in, and all of a sudden there's a break that happens, and so there's very sudden movement. You can think of it kind of like a rubber band snapping. And so part of what makes the effects of the earthquake change is how taut that rubber band was, right? Like the more it was tensioned before it broke, the longer the force that will happen. But you also have to worry about the material through which the wave is propagating. That is to say, if you toss a rock in water, you will get those waves and those ripples propagate out because the water allows that. But you can't really see that much of it in sand. You can see a little bit, but not as much. And so when, when you study the earthquakes, you worry about, of course, the magnitude of the earthquake itself, but even the material in which it propagates. And, and that's what will actually feel, you know, make the conditions felt at the surface. In here, I think, like, because it's shallow and because we have pretty homogeneous material, we don't have a whole lot of fractures and a whole lot of places where the energy of the wave can get lost, you can feel it at a long spread around. Um, sometimes you are in sections that are like a little bit broken up. And anytime you have a junction or, or a change in material, those effects will be dampened. Just like, you know, the dampener you have at the top of your door that, that helps it close slowly, that can have an effect too on the earthquake wave, things like that. Great information. Stay with us, Professor. For folks just joining us, we're following breaking news right now. At about 1023 this morning in White House Station, New Jersey, there was a 4.8 magnitude earthquake felt by so many of you right here in Connecticut. We're joined by Ari Perez. He's an associate professor of civil engineering at Quinnipiac University. Professor, if you could please give us a sense of the history of earthquakes in the Northeast, in New England, um, the fault lines that we may have underneath us that, frankly, uh, I'm not that aware of because this is such an infrequent event. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. Certainly, Connecticut is not a state that I would think of as very seismically active. You know, depending on the geology and, and the plate tectonics of, of the place where you live, you might have a lot more earthquake activity. I'm originally from Honduras, and we get quite a bit of earthquakes there. And then I did my graduate studies in South Carolina, which is the most seismically active state uh, on the East Coast. But in Connecticut, you don't really see it because we don't have the geological conditions. That doesn't mean that it cannot happen at all. It just means that it is much rarer. It is certainly not something that we think a whole lot about. Uh, unlike in California, where you have very strict seismic design codes in order to combat this because seismic threat is ever present and also south carolina which you know we all think of the largest earthquakes happening on the west coast but the charleston earthquake of 1896 was actually really really large one of the biggest earthquakes uh in the united states history again in the northeast it's not something that we have a whole lot of thought about you know outside of very dedicated circles because it's not as big of a threat professor before we let you go um we seem to be able to predict so many things with our weather patterns, right, through all the technology that's advanced here in the last 15, 20 years. Can we predict earthquakes? And if we can't, why not? So we cannot because we just don't have the level of data and understanding that is happening at those depths to accurately predict them. Again, think of like as a rubber band, right? Like 
the more you stretch it, the more you can figure out, oh, we're getting close to it snapping, we're getting close to it, but understanding exactly the moment where it will snap is, is not something that you can really do. Uh, and so we have a good sense of when earthquakes might happen. Again, like the more you pull on that rubber band, the more stress builds up underground, at some point it has to be released. And, and if you look at some of the popular culture, and we are expecting a big one in San Francisco because it's time for it, but you know, a big one in its time, I, I'm putting them in scare quotes because those are not very technical words. We don't, we don't really know, we can't forecast it like we can the eclipse that we know will happen exactly Monday afternoon. We can get a sense of when the pressures might be building up just like we can in an earth uh, in a volcano, right? Like, hey, this hasn't happened for a while. There's likely stuff building up that might come out. But at the end of the day, it's gonna be a very, very short heads up for the earthquake itself. And, and that heads up would actually just be the very beginning of it where very sensitive instruments might be able to catch on to little tiny tremors before people do. But, but you're talking about minutes here usually in terms of a heads up. All right, a tutorial in civil engineering this morning from Quinnipiac Associate Professor Ari Perez. Professor, if possible, if you could stay on with us, we're going to switch gears here momentarily, but we appreciate your expertise and your time this morning on short notice. Let's